So hello everybody, welcome to UU's virtual roundtable. My name is Sarah and I'll be today's moderator. Um, here's a few things just to, you know, keep in check. So um, today we have Amanda Lopez uh, asking, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, and she'll be talking about, you know, voting stuff regarding to that. Um, so before we get into that, uh, I ask you everyone to mute during the presentation um, just to minimize distractions. And afterwards we can have a bit of a discussion and talk about the topic a little further. All right, thank you. And you can take over, Amanda. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Um, I recognize a few, few names within here, uh, but first I wanted to thank uh, Martha as well as Paul um, for the invitation. I've been doing quite a few of these and uh, was happy, I'm always happy to get an invitation to talk about um, emergent kind of things that are going on. I know this is likely the, the largest election of my lifetime for many reasons. And so uh, anytime we have the opportunity to you know, give voters information and then what I hope is confidence in the electoral process in New Mexico, um, you know, we always take advantage of that. So uh, just to give you kind of a little snapshot um, of me, and, and I usually don't do that, but what I have found is, is that during some of the discussions um, that can be greatly polarizing and politicized, it's kind of nice to give kind of a, you know, 30 second to a minute background on me um, just so maybe you can get an idea of kind of my worldview, um, my background, etc. So uh, my name is Amanda Lopez Askin. Askin is a nice um, Jewish name. It's a derivative of Ashkenazi, and that's actually my husband's name. So you had it right, Sarah. Uh, I, uh, I was born and raised in uh, Doñana County, Las Cruces, at what is oh. now um, uh, in our local hospital, MMC. Uh, I'm a three-time Aggie. Uh, and my background is mainly in mental health, um, education, and uh, child advocacy, which is kind of a windy road to uh, the clerk's office. But what I found when I was earning my doctorate was that I didn't necessarily love the idea of being a research professor. I love to teach, and that gave me a lot of energy, but I didn't find doing research and writing something that I love. So when this challenge came up of uh, applying to be the clerk as there was an appointment available in September of, of 2018. I, I took that. I was chosen out of 14 people. Um, I was very honored to be chosen. And when I asked the universe for a challenge, um, the universe answered in a very big way. Um, and so the first election of 2018 was the very high profile um, CD2 race, as many of you may remember. So I have learned a lot. I have um, really gotten to love elections. I've always loved voting, but I've really gotten to love elections. And I would be remiss if I did not mention um, my chief deputy who's on this call as well, who's on the Zoom. She, she started at the clerk's office six months before I did. She's an appointee and um, she continued to work with me. And I think we're a good team, uh, definitely a good team. And I appreciate all of her support and the leadership she provides our office. And that would be Lindsay Bachman. So hi, Lindsay, and taking time out of your Sunday for sure. Um, so I'm going to start off talking about what I think is the frequently asked questions. And I will do my best to follow the chat, but feel free to jump in if something pops out at you. Um, with, this can be more of a conversational. I think that tends to be a little more uh, engaging and, uh, than me just kind of giving a soliloquy for you know 20 minutes or so. Um, so I'm going to go back to March. Um, March was when, you know, really January, uh, when we started to eh, kind of clue into COVID and what was what was happening with COVID. February headed around and I think we were, those especially science um, focused people kind of had their, I call it the spidey sense up about COVID. And then in March, I think we all kind of were like, this is, this is coming. And the reason I remember it so specifically uh, being on March 10th was because that was filing day for the primary and filing day is like a, a fun day for candidates. It's where you head to the clerk's office and everybody kind of schmoozes, and, you know, the political parties are around and you're kind of seeing who's running against who. And we were jokingly doing the elbow bump, ha ha, COVID, ha ha, COVID, you know, we're not going to shake hands, COVID. 
Uh, then it, the next week, it wasn't so funny, right? It wasn't so haha, -ha, right? Because um, people really started dying. And, uh, and not that that was ever funny, but it just seemed very far away from us. And so the following week, um, I made the decision to close my office several days actually before the county did um, because I was reading the science and I was getting very, very scared. So we closed our office to the public, but we continued to work and the majority of the staff did work remotely for, for several months. But in that, in that time frame, Lindsay and I and other clerks across the state started having these discussions. What does this mean for the primary? Then we saw Wisconsin. I mean, you can raise your hand if you, uh, if you remember what those scenes from that night in uh, Wisconsin were, right? And they were deeply distressing um, to the point where I remember sitting on my sofa, I was up late at night, and it was funny because somebody mentioned, I think it was Paul. Paul, you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, oh, elections has been, uh, was been on the news. I am so in elections that I'm always shocked when people are like not tuned in, right? So, um, but that night specifically, I remember getting on Twitter. Now, Twitter is an interesting place for sure. And if it's a snapshot into our world, it can be the greatest place on earth and kind of one of the scariest. But the, the scenes that I saw in the photos that from people that were taking that were trying to vote, uh, shook me in such a way. People, um, even talking about it makes me emotional, um, standing in line all day, some of them with walkers, um, with signs saying, this is ridiculous. And all I could think about is my community. What are we gonna do? Um, how are we gonna handle this? I have to prepare. And so that's what we turned around and did. We turned around and got to work. How do we safeguard our community the best we can, but still run an election? And so we started to promote absentee ballots. And we always had absentee. And in New Mexico, we're fortunate because we're a no excuse state. If you say that you are going to be watching a soap opera all day on election day and you want an absentee ballot, you can have one. In other states, you need, some states have, you have to have a notary sign your excuse from a doctor. I mean, it's pretty extreme, but in New Mexico, if you want to vote via absentee, luckily you're able to. So we started talking about the safest way is absentee, the safest way is, ab is absentee. And then we started fit looking at our 40 sites for election day. We have 40 sites across Doñana County and I knew, based on what I was seeing around the country, the discussions um, that were happening um, regionally, statewide, that it was going to be a challenge to staff our sites. If you consider 270 of the poll officials, poll workers, otherwise known as election officials, 270 of them, um, out of 270, 170 were over the age of 60. Oh. And that did not include any coexisting conditions. It did not include family members. It did not include, you know, immunocompromised, things like that. Uh, that is when I really started to get concerned. I also knew that we were going to have to do an extreme version of PPE at all of our sites for those who did choose to keep. So how do I balance keeping our having great turnout? Because that's what I firmly believe in, right? It's like the better we are is the more people who vote. Um, how do I balance that with then keeping the staff safe and keeping the community safe? So I made a very difficult decision and, and frankly, it was against everything I believed in um, connected to um, uh, participation, but I chose to consolidate 40 of our sites into 21 on election day. Wow. And it was, um, it was not ideal in so many ways, but I also knew that I, could, I, couldn't, I couldn't staff these sites. And when I say I couldn't staff the sites, it's not an exaggeration. Beyond that, I also knew that we would only be able to control so much at each of the sites and we only had so much time in, in terms of PPE. So we made the plans to do that. Um, and frankly, we barely got those open, right? Um, the sheriff, who is beyond being an amazing college and, colleague and leader, is also a, what I consider a good friend. And she offered, I believe it was 10 of her staff to help us. Now we needed about 60 people. Um, I had probably five or six people from other departments in the county also join us. So think about that's 15 people that I would not have been able to open those other sites. The morning of, we had several people call in and some of our sites um, in the Southern part of the, the county were almost at risk for not even opening. And that's with the 21, okay. Um, not ideal, certainly. 
What I also was realizing at the time was that the absentee ballots, the timelines were not realistic. We were telling people the Thursday before because the statute was telling us, right? Election law was telling us, you have the Thursday before the Tuesday election to request an absentee ballot. Now I ask you, how realistic is it for us to request something? I mean, it's, I knew it wasn't. Um, and so uh, people were not happy. Um, my dad, who um, is, um, you know, utilizes a walker exclusively to get around, lives in La Union, which is in the south part of our county. And he didn't get his absentee ballot in time. I'm the clerk. He didn't get an absentee ballot in time. Uh, he usually votes at La Union Elementary. He had to go to Anthony City Hall. Uh, so I, a lot of the challenges that happen affected people that I love dearly, and it was not ideal in a lot of ways. Ultimately, there was an amazing turnout. We had um, 26,000 people participate in a primary that historically has gotten about 20,000. So a lot of it was the absentee that made, um, you know, that, that made that difference because the word got out and then the heightened awareness about the election meant that more people turned out. Uh, but within that, we also knew there were some things that we had to figure out. Um, and, and so that gives birth to House Bill 4, or sorry, Senate Bill 4. I always use those interchangeably. So let me pause and see if anybody has any questions so far. I'm going to head to the chat. Or maybe Sarah, is there anything? Not yet. Okay. Uh, nothing on my end. Um, if anyone wants to unmute and ask a question, that's more than okay too. So if anyone has questions, feel free to unmute. So that uh, you're going to talk about that. Evidently, the uh, the bill uh, made it possible to, for you to do it uh, earlier than Thursday because I know we got our absentee ballot much earlier than that. Yes, and I'll talk about um, Senate Bill Four. Any other questions before I dive right in? No. Okay, so uh, we started as a clerk's affiliate and clerks across the state talking about what would be some fixes that we have learned from the primary. What would be some things that we, we knew that uh, would help us? And um, we started out with a, a bill that actually included um, automatic um, ballots to mailable addresses, okay? So keep in mind that it's mailable addresses. And that would be voters who have updated their voter registration um, or voted since December of 2015, right? Um, and so it wouldn't be all of the all of the voters on our voter roll, but it would be a good majority of the of the active ones. But that was quickly um, that was quickly shot down. It was I should say amended, and um, the negotiation was that actually clerks could automatically send out applications. Now previously. I necessarily wouldn't send you an application. You could request one and it would be at the voters request. I need to apply. Absentee ballots are always initiated by a voter. So when you hear stories like, oh, I got a ballot in the mail, I don't know how that happened. The likelihood that it's actually an application is very high. If there is an actual ballot in the mail, it has been initiated by a voter. And um, that, that's it often in a, a, a a point of confusion. So uh, what House Bill, what, sorry, Senate Bill 4 did allow for is for clerks who chose to send out, clerks who chose could send out applications to all mailable voters. Um, what it also did was implement and really mandate the use of intelligent barcoding. Right, so if I order from Amazon right now, I can click on the button and I know exactly that my package is in Indiana, I know it is in Santa Teresa, I know the next day it's going to be in my hands. We couldn't do that with absentee ballots before, but because of the implementation of this Senate Bill 4, when you go to the Secretary of State's website to check the status of your ballot, has it been received, you can track it in the mail. And so that will hopefully give voters a whole other level of confidence to be able to watch their ballots uh, through the mail. Additionally, what it did was it um, supported the idea that, well, it actually gave us October 20th is the deadline to request an absentee ballot. Now, that is really the last day that we think is a, a, a realistic in terms of the turnaround. And that was based on feedback from the post office, quite frankly. We know in Doñana that our ballots go to El Paso. 
Okay. So October 20th is, you know, I is, is pretty much it for me. I wouldn't request anything after, uh, and you can't, frankly, after October 20th, I thought that was a good day. I, I frankly wouldn't has, I wouldn't send anything after October 26th or 27th. And I think if you're already at that point, um, just to be double, triple safe, um, I, would, I wouldn't even hesitate to walk it into a polling location. And that takes me to another point about the Postal Service. So let's talk about that. I have received, I mean, I could count probably two or three inquiries a day. Would, how do you feel about the Postal Service? What do you think about, you know, the, um, the equipment being taken out? How can, you know, I, and so I want to talk about that. During the primary, what we discovered and what we really built on was a very strong relationship with the post office. On election day, literally people, postal workers from um, our county, from our city, went to El Paso to make sure there was not even one stray ballot at a post office there. So when we talk about the politicizing of the post office and we talk about these larger scale discussion, discussions coming on that that you know, pit so many people against each other. What I've discovered is this continual collaboration and discussion with on the ground people who are postal workers who've been there 10, 15, 20, 25, 35 years, one gentleman, whose life work is to make sure that they do a great job. And now that their work is being looked at so closely, I have definitely get a sense um, that they're more determined to do everything they can to help us. They have said we will treat election mail as gold, and I as gold, and I believe them. I believe them. Um, my experience has been outstanding with the Postal Service, and uh, they 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 have given us many assurances, and the relationships we have built with them, I really believe support that. So I wanted to put that out there and give you that assurance about um, the Postal Service. I will be on the ballot for the first time in a general election and I will be voting absentee. And I will be sending mine via the Postal Service. That is how much I believe in the Postal Service and the services they provide. Um, I'm gonna ask Lindsay because sometimes I forget about Senate bill. Um, oh, in the primaries, how did the vote split by party? Um, I believe it was about 16,000 uh, Democrats and about 10,000 Republicans. Now that's about, the ratio's about right though. If you think, and I'm gonna use approximates here, so you think we have about 50, we have 125,000 registered voters in Joniana County, approximately, okay? Now that's not all active voters, but that's how many we have registered. We have about 57-ish Democrats. We have about 30, five, 36-ish Republicans, and we have about 33, 34-ish um, independents. We have, can't forget the Libertarians, you know, um, we have several of those, but th they don't necessarily, their numbers don't necessarily make a dent in the, the overall uh, data. But if you look at the, the 26,000 overall turnout, and then you have about 16 being uh, Democrats and about 10 being Republicans, the ratios are kind of similar to what the, what the registrations are as well. Um, Lindsay, do you want to add anything connected to House Bill 4? She always has a good nugget that I forget. That's okay. There are actually two things. Oh, um, two things, as your daughter would say. <laughs> two, that things. My daughter is four. Um, two things I have to tell you. So anyway, go ahead. <laughs> um, so the first is that um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not results will be final on election night. Um, and there's a lot of dialogue out there about like how there's something nefarious or something amiss or something wasn't planned correctly when there aren't um, total results provided on election night. So there's two things about that, two things about this one thing <laughs> that I'm going <laughs> to tell you. Um, and that is that first that, um, election results are never official in New Mexico until after the state canvass. And that's important because we have provisional voting in New Mexico and the way that provisional votes are accounted for actually takes place after election day, every election anyway. The other thing that Senate Bill 4 did was it basically helped us out as clerks, um, as clerk's offices, that in that we don't have to make a choice on election night what at like the 18th hour of work for these community members who have been there since 6 a.m., whether or not we're going to keep them going based on the volume that's left. 
So that's good for a number of reasons. So what the bill does is it says at 11 p.m., if the work is not done regarding absentee ballots, um, we come back the next day and start at 930. And that's important because that work is tedious. It's important that it be like diligently done, efficiently, efficiently done. And I think in the primary, um, I we had done a good enough job communicating that if we thought we weren't going to be able to finish that night, we would come back the next day. And we did actually have to come back for about two to 3000 ballots that had been, had started being processed, but had not been tabulated or counted. Um, so we do anticipate going into the second day. A large reason for that is um, it really depends on when we get the ballots, right? So on election day, we went into election day being fully ready to go. We had things tabulated as we could under law. We were ready. And then between three and four, we got like 4,000 ballots <laughs> from the sites. And there's just no way to, to physically do the accounting that we have to do. We have to keep every single piece of paper. We have to organize all that. And when I say we, I'm really talking about this appointed board of community members, right? They're, they're your neighbors. They're people you go to church with probably right? Like these are people who show up for elections in a big way every time for us. Um, and so that's, that's one thing that I wanted to point, point out about the bill. The other thing was, I know that we had um, kind of like a, a pre-Zoom question about two-factor um, authentication. And I just wanted to, I'm not sure exactly the roots of that question, but I did, it does raise something that happened with this bill that I think is important for people to know. And that's if someone, um, if you or someone uses your address of registration and requests an absentee ballot to be mailed to someone else's house. So like I request a ballot, but I'm gonna be traveling to Alaska. I don't know how many people are traveling this year because of COVID, but like, let's just say that happens. Then what automatically happens is the person who, like me, um, I would receive a notification at my registration address that says someone requested a ballot right from your house to be sent to someone to this address so it's like a way to notify you that voting activity is happening and that can be kind of confusing i think for some people because if it's you requesting your own ballot you're going to be like, of course right but it's also this security measure that people sometimes fear that they can you know that someone can request a ballot without them knowing so that's built into this bill as well um and I'm not sure, Mary, I think that question came from you. So if you, uh, Martha. it was Martha, actually. Yeah. Martha. Okay. It was me. Okay, perfect. So, um, if you have any follow up to that, we can talk through it more, but I did want to highlight that because I understood that to be a, a question prior to the zoom. What is the process for reviewing provisional ballots? Can you just comment on that? Thank you. Sure. So um, one of the things that I do um, specifically when I do training for election officials is, um, you know, I have this whole spiel about you may be the only person that a voter has contact with a first time voter. And so we make it warm and welcoming. We thank people for coming. You know, we want our, our um, polling locations to be very um, welcoming and also if somebody arrives at a polling location and they believe they have the right to vote and maybe there's some kind of um, misunderstanding about an address or for whatever reason we can't necessarily find them in our, our system. I, I really believe that nobody should leave in a polling location without voting. So at that time we are able to offer provisional, right? We offer the provisional ballots and it's based on the address given and so um, a person fills out a provisional ballot, it's put into a special provisional ballot envelope. And those are set aside. Those are not tabulated in the machine that night, right? So um, I think there's this idea, and this is, you know, really quickly that somehow the clerk's office counts votes. Well, we don't do that. Uh, um, you know, the election officials at each site manage all of the elect, all of the voters and the ballots that go into the tabulator, which is tabulating it right live. And then for the absentee, they are also uh, community members. We do not tabulate the votes. We don't even qualify them, quite frankly. It is community members that do that. And that's a checks and balances that we have in New Mexico. So once we have everything in the hopper, so to speak, we've gotten all, everything tabulated from all the sites. We've gotten all of the absentee. 
Then we have to deal with the provisionals and those are opened one by one and they are, um, um, they're, they're, there's a provisional, um, a board um, specifically that are looking at provisional ballots. And then they are what we call, um, I don't know if we call them hand touted those specifically. Lindsay, is that the, the vernacular we use? Yeah, so the way that it works is when someone is voting at a, at a voting location, they complete the outer envelope, kind of like an absentee ballot. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of information there that we can use to research the person and find out if they're qualified to vote. Then we would open the provisional envelope, take out the ballot. We we're required to keep the ones that are disqualified, and I'm going to tell you why here in a second. So we keep the ballots with uh, the the board that's appointed. That's also an SB4 change um, that there will be a, usually the county clerk was doing all this, but um, now the provisional ballot board, I think that's what we'll call them, <laughs> um, will go through and, and hand tally the ballot um, if it counts. No matter what, um, voters do receive a notification on how their provisional ballot status uh, moved forward. So what's, what's important about that, right, is that this is a very human process, right? We have elect appointed uh, members who are doing the work at the sites. We have human beings who are doing the counting of the hand tallying of these ballots. So there are many opportunities for that ballot to be reviewed for the voters um, ballot to count. So should a voter get a notification on the other end that says your provisional didn't count and they can prove that they were registered to vote, we can still go back they can appeal the decision that we made um, that was made by the board during the provisional hand tallying um, and actually have their voter count their vote count so it's lots of ways to make sure that if there's any sort of clerical mistake or any sort of like you know that the voter has the last word um, and frankly a lot of times um, there aren't a lot of those ballots that count but in 2018 we knew we saw a lot a lot of provisionals count and part of that was because um, people who voted absentee were required to vote provisional if they had an outstanding absentee. That's really no longer the case. Return to your absentee, it gets lost in the mail, it's in the back of your house, you don't know where it is, whatever the case may be, you can still show up at a polling location and send an affidavit and you'll be a tabulator at the polling location in person. Right. And that's um, College City, one of the things, just to jump in, Lindsay, um, we have students that are from New Mexico, let's say they're from Farmington, and they want to vote, and they come election day, and they're, they know they've registered, their parents registered them, and they don't understand that they have to be registered in Doñana County, so they may get insistent. Now, their vote is not going to be tabulated because they are not registered in Doñana County, but I also don't want them leaving um, without voting if they believe they have the right to vote, right? I think that's something we figure out on the other end, and I think Lindsay underscored something that we constantly try to, to um, shed light on in is is elect and, and my and this my, makes my husband crazy when I say this but elections are fair they're not perfect and that's because there is such a human factor involved right um, you know the perfectionist in me is is always really frustrated by this whole human error um, but we have humans run an election right and so when you when you deploy 250 people on election day and there's a lot of moving pieces um, you know there inevitably will likely be um, you know some clerical errors things like that and that's why provisional ballots are really really important and giving people People opportunity to vote. Um, I get I get you know distressed when I hear um, somebody has left a polling location um, and not not been able to to vote. And I'm going to go ahead. Yeah. And, go ahead. Oh, sorry. And uh, no, I was just going to feed off of what you're saying. Like, what's really great about New Mexico? elections is that we have systems in place to help us identify when there might be a clerical issue or to provide many opportunities for there to be a review right so in the general election there's the review of the boards at the sites at the end of the night so I'm count I'm keeping count over here then there is the canvas um, that we do that is the state canvas that is done and then there's a general election audit that takes place um, after every election um, in a presidential or in a congressional year and the way that that works is that um, uh, an, an auditor is selected and we test the machines to make sure nothing was amiss so elections in New Mexico are actually some of the best in the country and I don't know if Amanda if that's where you were headed I'll talk about that in a little bit I was like a little <laughs> 
what I wanted to, to touch base on um, was the question that Steve had, because I don't want to miss that. Um, are you planning to tabulate absentee ballots as they arrive? So I, I suspect, Steve, that we've had near, I want to say, Lindsay, has been like 9,200 applications so far, which is a lot. I'm telling you already, we have had near 10,000 people want to vote by absentee, which is outstanding for democracy in Doniana County, and I'm super proud of that. But what that 10,000 number, that 10,000 magic number means is, is that we can start... Um, we can start qualifying, and I say we, I should say the election board can start sorting, organizing, opening um, absentee ballots 14 days in advance. So they convene as a board and they start that process. So what was great about the primary is that we had up until election day, the Monday before at six o'clock, it was almost like eerie because every absentee ballot that had come to us up until that time had been tabulated. Now we didn't see any of the numbers, right? Because that is just, that actually happens. Um, we find out when you do, honestly, which people think is so funny, but it's true. Is we load the web page because, um, you know, we, uh, anyways, it, it gets to be very technical. We don't see them until you all see them. Um, and that's by design. And so everything up to election day it was in the hopper, right? And so election day, the ones that came through the day and then later that night, of course, when you get an influx of thousands and thousands of ballots at you know, 7 or 8 p.m., um, you know, the election, the, the total um, that were put in were delayed up until, um, I think Lindsay said a few hours the next day, um, you know, when they were, and I don't think any of the results changed, right? It really gets to be a big story um, when, it really gets to be a big story when results change. Um, Jim says, is there any way to get an absentee ballot other than through the mail? You know, we have the UACABA, which is uh, for military and overseas Amer Americans living uh, abroad, in which um, they are able, they have a special way in which they are able to get their ballot and, and they can actually do it via email. Um, but as far as getting an absentee ballot other than through the mail, I've never been asked that question. I don't think so. I don't think so. It needs to go to an address um, and we have to be able to uh, have um, documentation of all of those those processes along the way. The only exception I, I think is if you're visually impaired and use tools that help you um, annotate things. So not if you're, you use glasses, but if you need support um, additionally and you're used to using machines that mark paperwork um, those voters also just receive via the mail um, empty envelopes and their ballot is actually sent via email so that's pretty much the exception um, something i wanted to touch on which has really taken even the last week has taken on a life of its own is the discussion of election results so if we need um you know 200 and um I'll say 60, 280 individuals. And we knew for the primary that we just had on it, maybe 50. Obviously we knew that we were in for um, a big challenge. And so we started, um, and I've made this in my goal in life um, the last three months is to start recruiting really extensively across Doniana County. Um, and so you named the group and I have likely presented um, to them and uh, those would include the three school district, Hatch, Gadsden, uh, as well as Las Cruces Public Schools, pretty much every organization at New Mexico State University, the Realtors Association, the NAACP, I mean, I could go on and on. Um, and also just word of mouth, I think the national energy around election officials and kind of propping up democracy, how young people need to step up, it's time, you know, you've probably heard some of that. And I have been, and I feel cautiously optimistic, and I continue to say that, I feel um, cautiously optimistic about where we are. There have been, has been a great response, and I feel, um, I feel so much better than I did probably even a month ago. I was waking up at four o'clock going, okay, who else can we ask? Who else can we ask? Um, and, I, and I'm not, um, I have no problem um, coming with my hat in my hand saying, we need you. We need you, we cannot do it alone. We wanna run a great election for Doniana County, but we need the community to show up for this um, and really 
ideally those who are not at risk for COVID, right? And so people have responded in a big way. Um, and this leads me to the discussion on drop boxes and Dave and Jenny, um, you're asking about that. So let's talk about drop boxes because this is something I've been asked every day as well. These are, this is almost like the frequently asked questions version of, uh, of uh, my, my day, which is good. So there's a difference between secure 24 hour drop boxes and being able to take your ballot to a, to a site, okay? Now, last year, and this is where it gets kind of in the weeds, but bear with me. Last year during um, House Bill 407, there were a lot of election updates. And one of those was that it made space for county clerks to have those 24 hour secure drop boxes. If you were gonna run and get groceries on a Sunday morning and you all had your absentee ballots on your counter and you wanted to grab them up and go drop them, that's the idea. Those require literally immovable um, secure boxes, right? Similar to the post office. Um, it requires uh, security, camera, both the alarm security, camera, fireproof, um, as well uh, being able to monitor in 24 seven. So, so the bill made space for that, but we don't have that. We just don't have the, between the procurement and the, the money, we have not created those in New Mexico yet. And frankly, I don't know anywhere in the state that has. And not because it's not something that um, I don't believe in and I th think would be great for voters, but because we're just not there yet, right? And so when this came up in terms of drop boxes, um, there has been some, oh, you can drop your, I don't want voters to be disappointed. I don't want them to head to Sonoma Ranch Elementary on election day thinking they're just gonna drop something off and not get out of their car, okay? And when a reality is, is they're going to have to walk in and submit their ballot, okay? So the law does make space for 24 hour drop boxes in which a voter can minimize, can basically take the, the human part out of it. Um, but we just don't have the infrastructure yet, however, because of the election official um, response, what I am trying to do is um, do everything I can to make dropping off ballots at each of the locations quick, um, routed very specifically instead of having to wait in line, as well as uh, being able to minimize contact with anybody, um, as well as maximize their time in and out, right? Um, so you can drop off your ballots at any polling location uh, during early voting and election day. What I am hoping people do is that if they want to vote in person, that they do it early. I would much rather see a great turnout over the entire month of October than to have 40,000 people on election day come to all of our sites and then that puts everybody at risk and it stresses the system. So, um, you know, as far as like secure drop boxes, we are making plans um, and there may be some additional guidance from our wonderful Secretary of State, Maggie Toulouse Oliver, um, and, but we are looking at even certain things we can purchase that can expedite voters uh, submission of their ballots at each of the polling locations. <laughs> Should you follow well? Um, I will tell you after every election, those nice provisional ballots, what's good? So Jim says, sh um, should I follow, I'm sorry, Steve says, should I follow our president's advice and vote twice? Um, and uh, okay, and we'll get to yours in just a second, Jim. Um, so after every election, I have a very nice list that I take to our district attorney. And that list includes names of people who have voted twice. And what I do to say to the district attorney is investigate these people for voter fraud. Um, so please don't, Steve, because I don't want your name to be on that list. You ask great questions. It seems like you're really invested in the electoral process. Um, so I would say the short answer is no. And the long answer is please don't, because I don't want to see your name on a list that, that then the DA has to call you. You know, the thing about voting twice is um, we do catch it. Our system is, is pretty phenomenal. And this idea that, that a clerks um, wouldn't know about it is, is frankly just bizarre to me. Um, but that leads me into this idea. Now, I have worked in child welfare. I have worked in mental health. Um, I have worked in the education system. I have been in higher ed. Um, and I will tell you this, we're on some lists in those categories in New Mexico that are concerning, right? Um, we're 48th, 49th, what is that saying? If it wasn't for Mississippi, you know, we wouldn't. Um, 
Right. But the thing is, is in New Mexico, we do elections really well and we don't talk about that enough. And part of the problem is, is the narrative, right? The narrative that kind of like slides into it, like, oh, there's something wrong with the system. Oh, voter fraud. Oh. And so it's like this continual and it, it takes flight. But in New Mexico, we have so many checks and balances in our system that when the Postal Service sent out a letter two weeks ago to 46 states saying that their voters were at risk to be disenfranchised, New Mexico did not get one of those letters. Oregon didn't. Um, Utah didn't. I don't think Colorado did. We were one of those states. How great is that? We were actually not on the, you know, kind of the, the bad list, so to speak or the risk, uh, the, the at-risk list. And that is because in New Mexico, we have so many layers in it. We have paper ballots. We can recreate an election for paper ballots that we have to keep for 22 months. We have to keep those paper ballots. We should always have paper ballots. It gives voters confidence. We don't have any pre-printed ballots. We have voting convenience centers in which you come and give your name and your address, and we print a ballot specifically for you based on your address. The paper ballots, um, you know, they can be subject to auditing and verification, um, and they always, always enable us to recount um, one race or all the races. Um, we have what's called air-gapped counting systems, and so it's basically um, our, our tabulators are never connected to the internet. They're, they're never connected to the internet. And so it's called air gapping, and so what that means is that they're not vulnerable because they're not connected to this internet. We have, um, you know, a process before uh, even the election starts and we have to give every iteration of the ballot goes into all of our machines. So if you think that there's, you know, we have 40, we said we have 120 machines, every single one of the machines has every iteration of the ballot. That means every possible combination um, goes through to, to make sure that it is accurate. Um, and then again, Lindsay spoke about this, but we have um, post-election um, canvas and an auditing. Um, and so these are all best practices that have been put into place over the last several years that make New Mexico arguably in the top five of election administration um, in, in, in the country. And, you know, I always say I went to the great university called New Mexico State University and I learned how to be a researcher. So when I first started as a clerk, I looked into all of these things. I looked into, um, you know, what voter fraud, I looked into auditing, I looked into paper ballots. And what I found was just a pleasant, pleasant surprise. And that I really feel confident in telling um, New Mexico voters and voters in Doñana County, we have a good system, I believe in it. And um, voters in Doñana County are very fortunate to, you know, to be basically have these systems in place. So, okay, when is the earliest date to drop off absentee ballots? So absentee ballots, the actual ballots do not start getting sent to voters until the first day of early voting at the clerk's office, which is October the 6th. So if you are one of these people on this list, and let me see how many, there's, there's 19 individuals on. If you're, let's say, nine of you have requested an absentee ballot at this point, you won't get it until October the 6th beginning. Um, and so as soon as you get it, you can walk it into our office. Um, we're happy to see you. Of course, we're following all of the, the COVID guidelines, but we're happy to see you. You can walk it into any of the early voting locations across the county that start that open on October the 17th. Um, and so as soon as, as soon as you can, as soon as you fill that, that out, you can walk it in or you can send it um, in the mail. Make sure it is um, sealed, signed, and completed sealed and signed. Um, let me make sure that I have not missed anything. That was everything on my list. I'd be happy to take any questions and Lindsay's here as well. Um, Jan, are you tired? I think Jan Thompson might be tired of hearing me at this point. Jan's heard this spiel a lot. Well, you do it a little bit differently each time. Thank you, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and some of us need to hear it more than once. <laughs> I hear that for sure. And Carol as well. Hi, Carol. I, I have a question, though, and to clarify this. Okay, say I'm, I, I've applied for an absentee ballot, and I fill it out. I mean, and I get it, and I fill it out, and then I walk it in um, to a polling place, that early polling place. How and how, where do I take it in relation to the people that are actually in line wanting to vote early. In other words, what's the security distance as far as COVID goes? Sure. Um, 
so during the primary, um, because I, I was on the ballot, I didn't work actually election day. And so what I did was I wandered all over our county. And one of the things that just, ugh, when I went to Sonoma Ranch, which is one of our busiest sites, I saw a line of people with absentee ballots in hand. And I knew because of the timelines, it wasn't their fault. They didn't do anything wrong. They wanted to make sure to get their ballot in. And so they had, they were almost forced to walk it in, but it was one singular line. That's the thing that we're planning for now, Jenny, is that what we're doing is trying to figure out how to uh, follow the election law, which I always say the best part of my job and, the, is, and also the most challenging is that I have to follow the law. And so um, to submit a ballot to an election official at a polling location, I would like for there to be two separate, um, this is my ideal world, but this also, this also depends on election official staffing. I would like for there to be people out front routing you to one line, one singular line in which hopefully there's not actually not even a line in which you're able to submit your ballot um, separate from waiting in line. So, you know, the polling locations, some of them, for, for example, Anthony City Hall, it's not a huge space in general. We're going to try to have it in the largest place. But if you go to there versus, um, let's say, um, I'm trying to think of one of our, our the city, city, city of Las Cruces, you're much more likely to be able to distance and not really have contact with anybody if you go to the city of Las Cruces than Anthony City Hall just because of the way the, the, um, the actual sites are made up. But we are currently, with about a month to go um, for early voting started at the government center, um, trying to do everything we can to figure out how to be compliant with law, as well as to minimize people's contact with others. And right now we're hoping what that means is two separate routings um, in which a person who's walking in their absentee ballot can submit it separate from standing in line and waiting for those who vote in person. Okay, but because um, I, I always come to the government center to, um, to vote early and that was would be my intention, but I won't, when will I know if I'm going to have to be close to people, I might as well just come in and vote if I, I have to be in line. So this is well, um, what I hesitated to say early is, earlier is, and I'll say this with a caveat, this is my plan and I'm hoping that it works out and I would encourage you to follow any of our social media pages or read our, get on our, um, our news release uh, list or, or maybe your organization can and then can forward it is um, we have purchased some they're like they're basically secure ballot boxes and I would like to put those on casters and in my ideal world I would like two election officials to be in front of the government center to be able to um, staff that and have you literally walk up and submit it into that um, secure the cure box. We've only have eight of them that we've purchased. They're very expensive. Um, I don't, I, I have to wait until those um, come in. I have to wait and see if I have enough election officials to staff those, but that is my plan. If you're going to bring your absentee ballot to the government center, the best way to do it is to just walk it over to the clerk's office because there's rarely a line and you can hand it to a staff member and walk out. Yeah. And, instead of going to the um, pull, actual polling location. So as you walk in the building, instead of taking a left to vote, you take a right to the clerk's office and you can hand it to a staff member. And that would be more of a backup plan, quite frankly, Jenny. So if, if I had it my way, you will be walking up and putting it into this secure um, bo um, box that's on caster, so to speak, that is staffed outside and never enter the building. Okay. Thank you. Question. Um, an absolute answer, but you know that's the best I can do today. What percent of uh, both voters or votes are certified? What percent are not certified? I'm sorry. What percent? When you say certified, what do you mean, Paul? Well, I mean that they're they they have been counted. What percent of votes are not counted? Um. I mean, they're there because they they didn't meet some. Uh, signature or they didn't meet some address, you know. Are you talking about, if you're talking about absentee? Um, well, yeah, well, even if you vote in person, you know. Right, so like, uh, for example, if you are somebody who walks up and you give, give us um, a verified, you, you offer your voter ID and you're within our system uh -huh. and you complete your ballot, 
assuming your ballot is filled out completely, your vote will count. If you fill out a provisional ballot and we figure out you're not an eligible voter on the other end, that will not count. The absentee, you must have their signature on the exterior of the envelope, and almost everyone completes all of that. So I would say very, very few. Very small. Huh? And that was an issue in one of the national programs this morning about about that. I just didn't know how, how big an issue that was. It's, it's not. And Paul, yeah. you actually bring up a really good um, item. SB4 was full of stuff, so we haven't covered all of it, even though we've been on this call for about... 50 minutes. Um, so there's a lot to unpack there. But one of the things that's happening this year is that if you return an absentee ballot and it doesn't have something on the outside in order for us to accept it or for or for the absentee voter board to accept it, because ultimately they're the ones that decide um, there as long as they are convened. So as long as they're tabulating and counting and doing all the work that they do, there's a curing process where we're required by law to try to contact those voters twice and let them know that either they forgot their signature or the last four of their social and they'll be able to come in and cure their ballots um, at our at where the uh, voting board meets, which is our um, election center warehouse. It's on Lakeside Drive. So all of that will be available via notice that we will send to those voters and they'll have the opportunity to come cure the ballot. So those sh that number should be even less this time. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say really quick um, is that you guys should have full confidence in Clerk Askin and her drive to to work out ways in which absentee voters can show up at the polls and not feel like they have to wait in line. I know it's probably annoying for us to get on these calls and say we don't actually have that worked out yet, but we but she is doing everything that she can in order to ensure that we have options that are safe, efficient, and secure for voters this election. So um, Jenny, I think what she said to you about going to the clerk's office is a, is a great thing, but if all of you guys will make sure that you're following us on social media, if you're on social media, um, and know that we will be alerting everyone as soon as we know for sure what will happen. But um, she's really doing amazing work in that way and in adapting and adjusting to the challenges of the pandemic. Thank you, Lindsay, and you're doing an awesome job too. Let me answer. Well, I, have, I have a question. Uh, when I was phone banking, I talked to a blind veteran who is new. He has um, applied for a write-in ballot, but he needs help filling it out. Do you have any suggestions as to how we get him help or should I go to his house or what? <laughs> um, you're, you're actually um, able to assist him by law. You can assist him and, and complete. Um, you know, New Mexico law does make space and quite a bit of uh, awareness of not, um, there's some exceptionalities that other people um, have that we need to address. So yes, you can assist that voter. He just needs it's to make his own mark on, when on the signature. Um, so I'm sure that he's accustomed to doing that in some way on other formalized documents. Mm -hmm. um, but voter is a voter who requests assistance uh, with a ballot can get it from anyone. And that leads like to for like uh, candidates and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You're, if you're a candidate, I'm sorry. Uh, I said, if you're a candidate, you can't. No, you can't. You can't help. <laughs> We've asked Will to help. How can um, we get out the voters? You know, Steve, I think asking questions like this, being part of groups like this, talking to your friends, your neighbors, your family, um, encouraging them to ask questions. I mean, I think COVID has created really a challenge in individuals functioning like they normally would before the largest election of likely our lifetime. And so that's why I have, this is like the, you know, 20 or 30th of this that I've done um, because anytime I can get in front of a group of people, cause I think of you all are like, I tell you and the ripple effects of the information I give you are, are gonna continue. And so I hope you say, oh, I was on this Zoom this morning and no, actually you can't do this or this is what they wanna do or um, I, I hope that that happens. So Steve, I think you're doing it. I think I'm doing it. I think collectively, hopefully we'll make a difference. Um, and Jim and um, Jim wants to know, can another person deliver the absentee ballot? Yes. So uh, law does allow for um, you know the voter themselves obviously to to submit their absentee ballot, immediate family member, or um, a caregiver. 
Mm. Now that's kind of a loose term, quite frankly. And so, um, for example, Carol, you're talking about this gentleman that just moved to New Mexico. He's blind. It, if you assisted him, technically you could be considered his caregiver and then be able to submit um, his ballot for him. Um, as long as there's that accountability, there's an area on the exterior of the envelope that if you're not the voter, then you need to identify who you are. Uh, can I uh, right now uh, request an absentee ballot online? Yes, so um, the live just started uh, last weekend and there have quite frankly been a few glitches uh, as there is with any large system, I think, implementation. But if you go to nmvote.org and um, nmvote.org, I will tell you, nmvote.org is very cool. I always say it's like looking at your voting credit history. You can go back and look at how many elections you participated in. I mean, I know I, I registered to vote in 1992 when I turned 18 and um, it was a big deal. You know, my mom has always been a very huge advocate of voting and participation. Um, but then I like look at like some of my college years and I'm like, wow, I didn't really participate that year. I wonder what was going on. Um, I think it was one year that I did not but you could see every year you participated. It's very cool. You can also make sure your information is up to date and then you can click on it. It says, um, obtain your absentee ballot. It will ask you for your driver's license um, number, so keep that handy. Uh, hi, I have a question, please. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm helping an elderly gentleman who has poor vision. He, he does not sign his name the same way exactly as he did 15 years ago when he registered to vote. How close do you scrutinize signatures to match what you have on record? So um, we don't have like this automatic um, signature verification system. We verify that there's a signature. And I say that the signature is only a problem if it becomes a question or a problem. So he, his submission will be fine. Um, and, and of course, if there was a question later, because we keep everything, we'd be able to review. And then if there was any question, it would be investigated. But it sounds like um, he, that's not uncommon. You know, people sometimes when they age, they may have conditions that can affect their steadiness and their signature just may be different. Um, yeah. And so um, we do verify there's a signature and there's also other verifying information, whether that be a social birth date. So all of things, those things combined create like that identification. So he, he should be good to go. Good. I want to say I emailed your office last week with a question and I got an answer within three minutes. So Keep up the good work. Thank you. Um, I have another question, <laughs> follow up on. Okay, I applied online last weekend and it, I, I don't know which you know, website I put in, um, but you said there's a glitch in one, but what showed up, it showed all, you know, my name, my address, all, all my registration information and um, I, I can't remember if it asked for my driver's license or not, but um, you said, you know, I'm assuming it was the one that, you know, I got to the place where you were saying that you, there weren't any issues. One, yeah, and I, when I say glitch, I, it, it, did, it just was a soft open of the site. They've been, I, or the IT department had been working on it for many, many months because previously you had to input your entire social. And so there were, they had to, they had to fix that. And so I shouldn't say fix, they had to update it. So it was a soft opening last week. And with most soft openings, if there's anything they have to kind of, you know, make sure is short of, they've done that. Most people have not had any issue. So if you got in there, you requested it, there's only one site to do it and then vote. If you Google absentee ballot, New Mexico, it took you there. If you found yourself and your voter information and you click, click, click and moved it forward, then um, you're good to go. If you have any questions, you can always feel free to contact your office or get back on that site and just confirm that everything is good. Okay. And I did get an email response saying that it was received. So oh, I don't know if that makes good. any difference or not. Yeah, you're good to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a little after three. Do we have any other questions before we wrap up for today? It's been like to thank you, Amanda. And, uh, Lindsay, thank you, thank Amanda. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, yeah. thank you guys. Uh, thank you very much, we're going to have uh, the uh, American. Uh, 
Indian director from NMSU uh, do a round table for us. Awesome. Well, thank you all for asking great questions, being invested. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Amanda. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, how do we how do we support your reelection? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I will tell, I, today I'm presenting myself as a clerk and, and uh, you know, I wouldn't want to cross any boundaries and so, but you can use Google and Google has me, I will say that. Um, well, I also got your uh, sign in my front yard too. Um, <laughs> so much. Yeah, so and keep this in mind, I'm new to politics. This is the first time I've run. Um, I, I always say like, I wish I could apply for the job and have an interview and just get it, but apparently I can't do that. So I appreciate the support for sure. Well, Thank I you. Hope, I, hope right. we get, I hope we get to have you for a long, long time. Oh, thank you, Jim. Well, as long as you want to. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, uh, my husband, assuming he's, um, he's on board, which he is, so we have a four-year-old, um, so, and he's retired, luckily, so, you know, between that, we're able to manage both, and, and I'm very fortunate. Great. Thank so, you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Happy voting, and call us if you have any questions. We'd be happy to help you. Okay, sure. thank you. We will. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. Bye. Thank you. Everyone have a great weekend, and thank you, Amanda, for coming on. All right, see you next weekend, guys. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.